Uh, so let's. All right. So I'll give it just another handful of seconds. We'll let some stragglers come on in here and then I'll get started with my introduction. All righty. Okay, so I hope we've got a good number of folks in um, and let us get started. All right, well, welcome everyone to our final presentation in the 2021 Pond Nature Expo entitled Flowers of the Blackland Prairie. We're very excited to have Carol Clark here today to speak about one of the natural wonders of our region of Texas. Carol is a member of the Texas Master Naturalist Blackland Prairie Chapter. She is a longtime member of the Native Plant Society of Texas, where she is the chair of the Bring Back the Monarchs to Texas Committee, and she is also a Monarch Watch Conservation Specialist. When she's not busy speaking to the community about pollinators or native plants of Texas, she enjoys looking at her own, she enjoys looking after her own colossal monarch butterfly way station and private wildlife refuge in Cook County. And she also has a blog about native plants and animals of Texas at carolsworld.net. And so without further ado, here's Carol Clark presenting Flowers of the Blackland Prairie. Carol. Okay, hopefully I'm not muted and everyone can hear me okay. And okay. Uh, volume is good. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is going to be a very easy program for you. It's more or less a visual tour of some Blackland Prairie remnants uh, throughout the seasons. So not a lot of heavy content, not a lot of heavy teaching today. Just sit back and relax and enjoy the views. Um, the Blackland Prairie may be a phrase that you're familiar with or not. And so let me define that really quickly. It's a region of Texas, takes up about one sixth of the land area of Texas. Um, and it's sort of this long skinny wedge. It starts just above Sherman at where it's widest and then it tapers very sharply and goes all the way down towards San Antonio. The soils in the Blackland Prairie region are derived from the underlying white limestone rock. And in our area, at least, they can be really really dark soils. They can be blacker than a thousand midnights in the bowels of a cypress swamp with no moon, uh, just pitch black. And they're very rich and fertile soils in their natural state. Now, unfortunately, only about uh, one tenth of 1% of this Blackland Prairie, which was so rich and so fertile and so full of flowers, is left in its natural unplowed state. Once you plow it, you sort of destroy the soil structure and the drainage, and um, it just isn't the same after that. But there are some good remnants, including this one at a public park in Plano, Oak Point Nature Preserve. Uh, here's another view of uh, Oak Point Nature Preserve. Not all the park is like this. It's about the size of Central Park overall, and only a small portion of it is good remnant blackland prairie. But look at the diversity of wildflowers taken on this May day. Here's another one in McKinney. This one is in private hands. Unfortunately, the uh, landowner does know what she has and she's taking good care of this prairie there. Another view of Oak Point Park in Plano. So let's start in the cold months. Um, the beginning of the year, everyone is, is waiting for those dim winter clouds to clear, just waiting for those first spring wildflowers. And trout lilies are a great way to start the wildflower season. They start blooming around Valentine's Day. And if you look carefully on social media, you'll be able to find some trout lily walks where experienced leaders can take you right to where those trout lilies are blooming. Places like Spring Creek Forest Preserve in Garland. Uh, there are some at Oak Point in Plano, some at the Herd Museum in McKinney, a Cedar Ridge Preserve in Dallas, and some other places. Says, these actually have an interesting life history. They're only one little leaf popping up for six years, and then in the seventh year, they have two leaves and begin to flower. 
Crow poison is a plant that will bloom about nine months out of the year. Unless it's very hot, crow poison will be blooming. And sometimes it will bloom right through the winter if we don't have a very cold winter. You can notice it. It has a yellow center and you can differentiate it from our native onions by that little bit of yellow on the petals in the center. A little bit later, but not very much later, our prairie verbena begins to bloom. And this plant is almost luminous when the light is behind it in the evening. It literally glows a little bit. Um, a great combination is this four nerve daisy, the yellow flower, with that prairie verbena. <clears throat> and the great thing about prairie verbena is it will bloom for about nine months out of the year. It's a tough prairie survivor, it likes a disturbed area, someplace, you know, historically maybe a buffalo wallowed there. Now maybe it's roadside mowing or some construction, but it'll show up and it will persist until um, the native grasses really get strong and growing there. Then it doesn't compete so well. Another early bloomer is our Mexican plum. It kind of looks like a Bradford pear, but Bradford pear is kind of a bad word in um, native plant circles. And this Mexican plum is absolutely native to our region. Uh, provides great nectar for pollinators, butterflies, and bees. And it also smells great. Compared to the Bradford pear, uh, this tree is a big, big win. Red buds, you've probably seen these in landscapes as you drive around, but they are native to our area. And they are also a great pollen and nectar source for our native bees. Pink evening primrose, you might see this and say, wow, what a great wildflower display. Um, and they are beautiful and they are native plants here, but they're also a, a species that favors disturbance. So you're more likely to find these along a heavily mowed and disturbed roadside than you are in great numbers in an undisturbed prairie. There will be some there, just not large quantities. But the next things that you'll see starting to bloom in the spring are the wild onions. And we have quite a few species and subspecies here in North Texas in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. A lot of our subspecies uh, fall in the Allium canadense uh, species. And we have a white one, Allium canadense fraseri. We have a pink one, and that one is fragrant smells like hyacinths, um, some people say, and it is a beautiful little pink onion. So the hyacinth smell is right there in the name, Allium canadense variety hyacinthoides. And then we have these really crazy polyploid onions of the same species that the white one and the pink one were. Um, and these polyploids actually have extra genes. So they end up having crazy uh, structures up on top where there are bulbs, just like the bulbs that are underneath the ground. There are sort of papery structures, extra bracts, some flowers, some leaves, just all kinds of wacky stuff going on on top. Because of those extra genes, they no longer have to flower and be pollinated and set seed normally like the other Canada onions. So these are all uh, Allium canadense. And one last view of that crazy onion. Most people have seen these, but have uh, very little idea what's actually going on with these onions. Another early spring plant is the blue-eyed grass. And it's not a grass. It's actually related to irises, tiny little thing that you might find mixed in lawns and parks or out on a native prairie. Uh, if you're short, like blue-eyed grasses, you tend to bloom early in the season. So these things get going pretty early. And uh, they can look like, they can bloom so densely, they can look like fake bouquets just stuck in the grass. Uh, they're quite, quite beautiful. Texas dandelion, not really a real dandelion, but it is related. 
Uh, it has a lot of the same uses to both creatures and humans that real dandelions do, but it's taller and the flowers are larger. Um, and this is not one that you're going to find growing in your lawn like the regular dandelions, but more like out in the wild in a disturbed prairie site um, or at the edge of a road. Sometimes you'll see a whole roadside covered in white flowers um, in the spring. And we're moving on into April now, uh, roughly. These are blackberries or dewberries. They're members of the rose family related closely to roses. And uh, they are just big favorites with the pollinators. If you have a chance to stop and look, you're going to find these covered with native bees native butterflies, all kinds of creatures that appreciate members of the rose family. One of our more unusual and more difficult to see native prairie flowers is the prairie celestial. Um, and the color is hard to describe. It's like a clear blue summer sky. Why are they hard to see? Well, there are not that many left. Most have been destroyed due to farming in the region, but it's also because of the timing. Each flower stays open for only about four hours in the middle of the day, uh, somewhere, you know, between 10 and 2 maybe. It depends on how much cloud cover there is that day. But if you're not there when they're open, they roll up very quickly and stop blooming after that. So they get all their business done in basically four hours. Wild hyacinths, another gorgeous local prairie native. This one is easy to find in antique cemeteries in the McKinney area and in other good native prairies nearby. Um, this was a food that prairie settlers found they could eat, but most of it's just been destroyed due to the plowing that came with farming in this region. Again, with those rich soils, uh, there was a big temptation to plant cotton and other crops here. So most of the Black Vine Prairie has been plowed at least once. Prairie foxgloves, this drop dead gorgeous plant puts on such a show um, in the late spring and early summer. And yet it is one of our Texas natives. And if you know where to look at some of our existing prairie remnants, like the Park Hill Prairie, the Climber Meadow, uh, Oak Point Park in Plano, Arbor Hills in Plano, you can still find this plant blooming. Gara, we have quite a few Gara species and some bloom earlier and some bloom later, but they all have this funny whiskered asymmetric look to them. And the little stigmas, the female part of the flower always forms a cross in this, in these, uh, in this group of species. So you can be looking for those. They could be white or pink or a little bit red or some blend of those colors. Barbara's buttons have to be one of my favorite prairie plants. I just love these. And there aren't a lot of places where you can go see them. But when you can, you can usually see a large field full of them. Uh, they tend to grow on chalky slopes where that black soil has eroded. And um, they grow in some of the harshest environments, but they don't really thrive on competition. They like those spaces where hardly anything else wants to grow. So you'll find Barbara's buttons in pink and in white. They are butterfly magnets. You're going to find butterflies fighting for space on the Barbara's buttons when they're in full bloom. <clears throat> and they grow in just these lovely little clumps with an evergreen rosette of um, grass-like leaves that stays green all winter long. Here they are at my farm at, up in Cook County, which isn't on Blackland soil. And all of those little colorful specks in this picture are butterflies. The last time I counted, I came up to 37 butterflies in this photo alone. Yellow stargrass is another one of our tiny flowers um, that also prefers a space that isn't very competitive. Excuse me. Sorry, allergies always get me. 
Um, and there aren't a lot of places to go see this, but there are some in Plano. Uh, there are some at the Climber Meadow. There are some at Arbor Hills. And there are some at the YMCA camp in Anna that I know of. There are probably other places to see this tiny plant. Again, this is related to irises and not a grass at all. You may have seen coneflowers in a local garden, and if you did, there was a really good chance that those coneflowers were not the local coneflowers. Uh, they were probably Echinacea purpurea, which is native to Texas, but only to one tiny corner next to Arkansas. Our local coneflowers are better adapted to drought um, and changeable water conditions, and so uh, they are a better bet for a prairie restoration in this area area, um, and maybe even for a garden that's not going to get any supplemental water. So here it is, a local narrow-leafed coneflower, uh, Echinacea angustifolia, just means narrow-leaved. Here it is in the wild, growing itself with no supplemental water at all, and on a windy day where all the butterflies had to line up facing the same way so they wouldn't have their wings messed up. That coneflower is occasionally found in a white version. So you might be uh, plugging along on a prairie walk and seeing purple, 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 and occasionally there's a white one. Um, it just happens, and it happens with a lot of our native wildflowers. Every now and then a white version will be mixed in. Uh, the white flower on the right is a different thing. Uh, that's the wavy leaf thistle, Circium undulata, with the silvery, prickly leaves. Um, and a pale lavender to pure white flower up top. Prairie parsley is related to regular culinary parsley, but it's different. It's a tall, stiff plant with uh, very uh, leathery leaves. They look a lot like parsley, but they're fairly thick, and that's to withstand dry prairie conditions. And so this plant will pop up, live for a couple of years, and then those seeds will make new plants in other places. Paintbrush. Uh, this is one of our prairie plants that some years puts on a fabulous show, and some years you'll see just a few. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this year we didn't get the big show that we do sometimes. This is taken at Oak Point Park in Plano on one of their good remnant sections. Um, instead, that, that horrible freeze that we all went through uh, froze some of the emerged paint brushes, and so they had to start over again. And we had a few bloom in the spring. There are a few blooming now, and you may even see a few blooming in the fall, but nothing like the big show that we see in some years. One of the nice things about visiting prairies is they're always different. They are different from week to week, and from year to year, you'll see big differences in which plants are favored and which which plants didn't do as well. And that could be based on recent weather or that could be based on weather as old as a, a couple of years back where those plants uh, did or didn't get to establish a great root system and get ready to bloom. Firewheels are another plant that you're going to see along your roadsides as you drive through North Texas, but it is one of our local natives. And again, this is a species that really thrives on a little disturbance. You don't want to mow these before they've set seed, of course, uh, but they tend to grow in places where humans have had a lot of activity, uh, some roadside mowing and things like that. If you happen to be at the edge of a prairie where a creek runs through it, you may find some of these larger shrubs with big white clusters of flowers. And these are elderberries. A little bit later in the season, everywhere you see a white flower, there will be a green berry followed by a purple berry. And these are great favorites with both our native pollinators when they are in bloom and our birds who love to eat those berries. Uh, even some people will make syrups or jams or even wine out of the berries. Fringed Pecoon, what a strange name, but you can see the fringing on the edges of the petals. Um, and the strange name goes with an even stranger life history. 
all of these showy flowers, you might think that there was some awesome long tongue pollinator <clears throat> needed to come around and pollinate these. But it turns out that all of these showy flowers that I put on early in the season are sterile and they never make seed. Instead, this plant has tiny unshowy flowers a little bit later where all the seed is made. So nobody actually knows why it bothers to bloom with such a show. Marble seed. Um, uh, so the French Pacoon is also called um, marble seed in uh, some places. Here's a different marble seed. And uh, this one is sometimes, sometimes called hairy or soft marble seed. You can really see those soft hairs there. A very strange looking flower um, stalk that always curls around in kind of a, a scorpion tail shape or a snail shape. You can see that little curl to the left. This one is just beginning to bloom. Nipple cactus. This one I hesitated to include. I've seen it on a red sandy soil sites. And um, I had not really seen it on the Blackland Prairie sites until recently, but I'd heard that it was there. There was a small population at Arbor Hills Nature Preserve in Plano that somebody pointed out to me. Um, and then uh, that population, unfortunately, was in the way of some construction work. So it got paved over and it hadn't been seen there for probably a good 15 years. But we did find a new population there on the Blackland soils. Uh, last fall. And uh, so I'm happy to say yes, it's a Blackland Prairie native and it's still found in our region. We have a number of wild roses. Some are tiny little things with lots of itty bitty leaves and they creep around in the understory of the prairie, uh, really hugging the ground no more than a few inches tall. Others will make larger arching shrubs like this one. Um, and I believe this is Rosa setigera, but there are several prairie roses that are native to our region. And they range between white and a sort of a soft pink. We really don't have any deep red ones or other strange colors here. <clears throat> Sun drops. Sun drops are one of my favorite spring plants. Um, they will grow themselves with absolutely no help out on a dry, rocky prairie. Um, you can see the cracked chalk underneath them and they're still perfectly happy there. Or they can put on a great show in your home garden. They look like this in the wild with absolutely no help whatsoever on a fairly dry site where the soil is not deep and rich. Uh, so just imagine what they will do in your home landscape. Uh, these petals are paper thin and it's actually one of the favorite materials of leaf cutter bees to use for their nests because they like the texture of those petals. So sometimes you'll see this plant, you'll be pretty sure it's this plant, but you'll see big circles cut out of the edges of these petals. And that's the work of the leaf cutter bees. Other bees specialize on their pollen and you'll find uh, a lot of different small creatures visiting these flowers. For something completely different, here by the waterside and always found in a damp location is the spotted water hemlock. The stems truly are spotted with purple splotches. Uh, they're smooth and kind of striped. And so that's one of the clues that you're looking at this, but don't touch, just look, because this is one of the nation's most toxic plants. Um, and even a small piece in your mouth can kill you if even if you don't chew that. So if you're walking particularly with small children or adventurous teenagers, uh, please be sure that nobody picks and puts things in their mouths. Um, and, and you just need to be sure you know what you're looking at before you try a wild foraging for edible plants. 
twin flowered milk vine. I work a lot with native milkweeds, and this is one of the milkweed relatives in our area. Instead of standing up straight, it climbs along the prairie floor, and um, it spreads out for several feet from where it emerges. It's got these fuzzy little heart-shaped leaves, and then those will be uh, followed by the flowers, which you can see look like little fuzzy, stiff maroon starfish, usually in pairs. Once it's done blooming, it puts on these funny looking pods, almost like furry pickles. And those will stay on the prairie floor uh, for quite a, a, a few months before they're really ripe and burst open to show their seeds. So those are fun to look for. This uh, fragile looking flower with the really delicate, translucent, almost transparent petals is a white prickly poppy. Uh, but as beautiful as this top is, the bottom is um, unappealing in some ways. It's very, very prickly on the foliage, so seldom used in a home landscape, but still found in the wild in some places. Now, because it was prickly, plants like this um, were usually eradicated when people had animals. And so if there uh, was a place that ever had cows or horses or sheep on it, most of those really sharp, spiny plants were deliberately removed from that area. One of our very beautiful native milkweeds here is the antelope horns milkweed. And this is probably the second most common milkweed on the Blackland Prairie um, landscape. So we have uh, these neat tidy balls where the flowers fit really closely together. You see the green, the white and maroon combination. And the flowers um, are, are ball, well, the flower heads are ball shaped, but the leaves are sort of long and pointy and the whole plant sprawls out like this. This is a great host plant for monarch butterflies. Coral honeysuckle, that one on the left is obviously in captivity on my fence, uh, but this is a local wild native plant in many of our landscapes. You're gonna find this right at the edge of the prairies where the wood starts along those creeks. Most of our creeks have a surrounding of woodland called the riparian area. Um, and the coral honeysuckle is right at home in that woods and along the edges of it. It's a beautiful blooming plant that should be used more in home landscapes. Yellow passion vine is another edge plant and another vine. These tiny flowers are smaller than a quarter, maybe just a little bit bigger than a dime. Um, and nevertheless, they're complicated and interesting. So worth coming in for a really close look if you find these. The leaves are quite distinctive. They kind of look like duck mittens, a uh, sort of three soft lobes and wider than they are long. And then again, they have these little curly cues to help them cling to other foliage and climb up. So you won't mistake these for other things. They're pretty, uh, pretty distinctive in the landscape. Again, found at the edge or in the shade. Standing cypress. This one is a hummingbird magnet. Anything with long red tubular flowers like this is likely to draw in hummingbirds and offer a good nectar reward to those hummingbirds. So this is actually a biennial, uh, which is strange. If you want to plant these, you plant the seeds and one year you'll get this ferny lacy foliage that stays low, a little rosette, if you will. And then the following year, they'll pop up and they can be four feet tall and just covered with these blooms that keep coming and coming as long as it doesn't get too dry. So a beautiful native plant. It looks uh, fragile. It looks exotic. It looks like it would take a lot of water. And it's actually really found on some of our drier prairie sites. So a very neat plant to get to know. Here's another one of our native milkweeds and probably our most common one in the DFW area proper. So this is the green milkweed, Asclepius viridis. And sure enough, those flowers look pretty green with tinges of lavender and again, some white. 
Uh, but this one is a great monarch host plant. You can see uh, this little monarch egg laid right there on that top leaf. And these tender leaves will look a lot fuzzier than the older leaves of a, of a more mature leaf on the plant. Those are flower buds to the left, which will open to the flowers that we just saw. Texas yellow star daisy. Um, this one is actually still blooming a little bit in my yard here in July, uh, but it started way back at the end of March and or April. So this has been blooming a long time and it will keep blooming until it just doesn't get enough water. We've had a wet spring and not very hot temperatures this year. Uh, so it's had a very long bloom season compared to some years. Sometimes you'll find this as small as six inches blooming away, and sometimes you'll find it three feet tall. It just kind of depends on the conditions where it is. Leather flower. Here's another vine. Sometimes you'll find this mixed in with prairie grasses and uh, just out there in the understory of the taller grasses where it's finding some shade. But most frequently, you're going to find this in the shrubbery at the edge of a woodland where the woods meets the prairie again. There's a lot of interesting stuff in those edges. And it's very different from what you find out in the full sun areas most of the time. The Queen's Delight, this is a weird looking plant where the male and female flowers alternate up that stem to give you a spiral look to the inflorescence. Um, and if you were to break a leaf, you would find that it has a white sap. This is in the Euphorbia family. And a lot of those plants have sort of a toxic sap. So not very much will chew on these leaves. I don't really know of um, a lot of pollinators that use these flowers either, but it's kind of a curiosity of the prairie. Obviously something has pollinated the flowers because there on the right, uh, you see the uh, pollinated flowers forming seeds. cattails. If you happen to find yourself in a low swale on the prairie, you're likely to see some cattails, but they need wet feet to grow. They won't continue to grow in a dry area and they won't grow in deep water. They need to have the water uh, between a certain depth or just be right in that soggy soil at the edge of a wet area. Uh, there's that iconic cat tail. It's fuzzy. It's long and skinny. Feels like velvet if you were to feel that. And before that, you see uh, some cattails in bloom here with those long skinny leaves. Blue flax. This is our local flax. In some areas, you may have a perennial flax. Ours is an annual. That means it comes up, uh, does its blooming, sets its seed, and finishes, finishes its life cycle all in one year. If you see a, a flax that's more of a clump, that may be one of the perennial flaxes instead. About the same time that the flax is in bloom, uh, you may see green threads, but look at the soil in the background of this picture. This is a very dry area where the limestone is right at the surface. There is no deep, black, rich soil here. Uh, it's exposed chalk, and the green thread is loving it. It thinks that these dry, chalky sites are just what it needs with very little competition from other plants. So you're going to have plants that love the deep black soils, and you're going to have plants that love these chalky outcrops. Sometimes you'll have plants that could do either. There's a close up of that green thread. It's really frequently confused with Coreopsis, but if you look closely, you'll see that all the red on the green thread is in those disc flowers, those center flowers. There is no red on the ray flowers, or you might call them petals, um, that you see on some of the Coreopsis. It's another massive green thread, and this can look particularly good at Oak Point Park in Plano. 
wild petunias. We actually have several. And here are, I think, two different ones. Whoops, I advanced by accident. Let's go back. Um, there is one that's low and hairy and doesn't mind growing at the edges of prairies or out in the prairie. And then there are some that prefer the shade of the creekside woodlands. Tiny mouse melons has to have one of my very favorite common names, um, and they they really do look like itty bitty melons. They're only about an inch or an inch and a half long, uh, little speckled green things, um, and they're edible when they're speckled and green like this. You do not want to eat them once they are ripe and purple, uh, because then they become a violent purgative. Uh, so you don't want to do that, but they are just adorable out in the landscape. This is an annual. So where you see it one year, you may not see it the following year, or you might if some of those set seed. Rough leaf dogwood. Um, this is a shrub. It's not actually a, a wild flower. I took a few liberties, but it is something that blooms heavily. And when it's blooming, um, it's covered in blossoms. So I thought it should be included. Uh, this is our local dogwood. Nothing like the dogwood that has four large white bracts. Uh, there is a little bit of that at one preserve in South Dallas. But other than that, you will find just this. Um, uh, Drummond's dogwood or the rough leaf dogwood in other areas of the Blackland Prairie. That is a viceroy butterfly enjoying these blossoms. Also not a flower, but one of our local shrubs. You may find these red berries on the aromatic sumacs or the little three leaf sumacs in our area. Um, these are quite beautiful, but the flowers that preceded these that served the native bees back in February and March weren't very showy. So what you're really going to notice about this is the red berries. You can find standalone shrubs right out in the middle of a prairie um, or along those wooded edges. Pickerel weed is another one that must have a wet area. So growing with the cattails at the edge of a pond is where you're most likely to find this one. Prickly pear is pretty widespread throughout the Blackland Prairie. And there are probably several species that you could encounter. And those flowers can range from all orange or red to all yellow or some mixture of, of the two colors. Quite beautiful, and you can see these native bees are really busy gathering what they need from these plants. Some of our native bees are cactus specialists and will only forage on the flowers of cacti. Western horse nettle, though anything with Dell in the name, gives you a fair warning that you'd better watch out. And this one does have thorns up and down the stem. It does have uh, these sort of sharp spines under the leaves, um, but it, they're not venom filled like some of the other nettles are. They will give you a good poke and scratch you up if you get into these. Uh, they are favorites with our native bumblebees. And um, they're just a kind of an interesting plant that you may see out there related to tomatoes. So if that flower shape struck you as familiar, uh, that might be why they are related to tomatoes and eggplants and peppers. We have several of the prairie clovers here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, here are three different colors, three different species. There are actually a few more species than this, but they're quite beautiful. And as you can see, they really pull in the pollinators. Butterflies, native bees, these big fuzzy bumblebees and others really, really like the, the prairie clovers for good reasons. It's a great source of both pollen uh, and I think nectar too. That bumblebee on the upper left, you can see her leg is packed with orange pollen, and uh, you can pretty well guess she has gathered that orange pollen from the anthers of this purple dahlia that she's using. There it is uh, with its lacy little leaves. And just a human for some scale. Uh, this one is about thigh high out in a very good prairie remnant in Farmersville. There's a close up of that 
intricate flower had many, many little flowers packed in there. Standing wine cap. Uh, our local one is Calaroi Padata. There's also a spreading wine cup and there's some annual wine cups, not really in our region. Um, and, but this one is gorgeous. It comes in these sort of uh, rich, a burgundy, purplish red colors. Um, sometimes they're pure white, sometimes they're pale pink, but they kind of stand up. They're not the creeping version of wine cups that uh, you see at other places. We do have some creeping wine cup that's just not included in the show. Uh, so there you have a little native bee. I believe that's a leaf cutter bee really enjoying this flower and getting coated with pollen in the process. Millie blue sage is a common garden plant. You may have visited a lot of gardens where you've seen this flower, but it's also one of our local prairie natives. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of places where you can still go and see this out on the prairie um, in good numbers. But at Oak Point, there is this sort of chalky outcrop prairie and it grows very, very well there. So that's where this photo was taken um, on that tough prairie out at Oak Point. Even the Blackland Prairie is not a homogenous thing. There are all of these little uh, different areas within it. Sensitive Briar is one of my uh, favorite plants to play with when I'm out on a walk. And the reason is it lives up to its name really well. You can come along and just give it a light brush or a simple touch and those uh, lacy little leaves will fold up right in front of your eyes. So this is really fun for children to play with on a walk. Um, and by children, I think everybody from one to 99 is included in that. It's just a whole lot of fun to watch that happen. About the same time as the sensitive briar is in full bloom, our uh, little local skull cap is in bloom too. Now, in other parts of the uh, region, you may have perennial skull caps. This one is probably the annual version here. The flowers are very, very similar, uh, and they're both a little bit woody, but the uh, perennial version is more woody, a little bit more shrub-like than this one. Uh, two slim flowers, not necessarily uh, blooming at exactly the same time, but they were both vertical photos, so they went on the same slide. The ladybird centauri, which is blooming right now, and the cloth of gold, which probably is nearly done for the year if it's not already done. So um, just some tiny little things. They don't bloom very tall, but they usually choose one of these harsh rocky sites so they can bloom a little bit later because there isn't a lot of competition there. One of my very favorite flowers is the American basket flower. It's actually got a new scientific name now, Plectocephalus americanus, and Plectocephalus means spotted head. So perhaps we'll see some of that spotting in some of these subsequent pictures. This is that great little prairie remnant out at Oak Point Park in Plano. Uh, that's rather close to where I live, so a lot of my photos come from there. Here is that basket flower in a different colorway. Our local Collin County natives and a lot of our Dallas County native basket flowers are this deep, rich, royal purple. It also comes in the pale purple that you will see occasionally here and more often to the west and to the east. The reason it's called basket flower are, is this amazing uh, bud, the coverings of this bud, the fillaries, make this look like an intricate uh, Native American basket. So that's how it got its name. There's that spotted head. You can see uh, the little dots of the flower parts uh, making this look a little spotty. And one last photo of that park in Play-Doh. If you want to be sure that these things are still there to see in the future, you really need to communicate with your city, with your local parks department, ask them to put in uh, prairie natives to restore areas to uh, this kind of beauty and ask them to preserve what's already there. And the pale version. 
retiny or devil shoestring. This is a vine that's kind of rank and low, and it just creeps along the ground in a prairie remnant. Uh, but the flowers are stunning. The first one I saw one of the, the first time I saw one, I was pretty sure it was some kind of exotic orchid. And I went home to try to look it up and of course found out it was not even closely related to orchids at all. But it does have this bizarre shape. And that bizarre shape is to invite in the specialist bee that scrapes oils from this plant to feed its offspring. So it has this funny shape so that the bee will come and position itself just right to collect those oils. Button bush is one of my very favorite shrubs, but I included it in with the flowers because it blooms so heavily. <clears throat> You almost never see a button bush when it isn't covered with assorted pollinators. I had one in my backyard uh, before it got really too shady to bloom well. I spent a few minutes and counted 17 different pollinators visiting that shrub in about a 15 minute span. Ironweed should be blooming right now in our good prairie remnants. You can see this one at Breckenridge Park in uh, uh, Garland Richardson area. I think it's right on the border there. Uh, you can see this at Oak Point. You can see this in a lot of our good prairie remnants, Arbor Hills, Cedar Ridge, Cedar um, Hills. Anyway, lots of that, uh, but it's also, let me go back one, a really great pollinator plant. You can see that these flower heads are made up of lots of tiny flowers. That means that a butterfly can come and spend a long time uh, just on this one big flower head. Rosin weed. We have a couple of different relatives of rosin weed. There's a white version that has big lacy leaves, and there's a really tall version that can get nine feet tall, bloom all up and down that nine foot stem, um, and have giant leaves two feet long that are all cut into little finger shapes on the edges. Uh, but this is the one that you're more likely to see the rough stand rosin weed, and it is in most of our parks that include a little bit of prairie. Yucca, one of our common local yuccas is the yucca arcansana. It has these bell-shaped flowers that hang down and a really unique pollination cycle. I'm gonna run too long if I tell you about that today. Here it is growing on that special prairie remnant out at Oak Point Park in Plano. Horse mint is an annual that you're, uh, you're going to see all over the place. You'll see this on disturbed roadsides. You'll see it in uh, good prairie remnants that are rich with prairie grasses and other flora, um, and even construction sites. It just sort of pops up anywhere. It's an annual, so it gets all its living done in one year, set seed, and then will show up somewhere else when those seeds are dispersed. Buffalo burr. Uh, this one, the name burr, uh, should give you a hint. It's very, very prickly. Almost everything except the flowers is prickly on this plant. So it's not popular. And it's been nearly eradicated from places where people have had cows and horses and sheep. Uh, but it is really good for our native bumblebees. So if you're looking to restore an area, you might consider including it anyway. Wand milkweed is another one of our local milkweeds and you notice it occurred much later in the program than the other two milkweeds because it blooms later. It's blooming right about now. In the middle of July, all this heat, this plant is in its full glory with these strange downward hanging clusters of flowers that can be striped, they can be very purple like these, or they can be nearly all green. Uh, so it just depends on the plants. But these are single stems, not usually easy to find. And when you do find them, you won't find um, lots and lots all in one small area. You're going to have to walk around uh, to find the next plant and the next plant. Annual sunflowers. The sunflowers that we eat 
are, are derived from these annual sunflowers that were native to North America and have been in cultivation for thousands of years. Uh, long before uh, white people settled on these shores, we um, had people growing and selecting traits for sunflowers to give them bigger and better seeds. Rain lilies. If you've ever seen a place uh, that you drive by often, um, one day and then a couple of days later, all of a sudden it's covered with these white flowers, uh, you may be seeing rain lilies. They pop up very quickly after a hard rain from underground bulbs. They can grow really fast because they have these underground bulbs. And within just a few days of that rain, they will burst into bloom. When it dries out again, uh, they'll retreat underground and wait for another cycle to bloom. So you can never predict when a rain lily will be in bloom. They are or they aren't. But when they are, the fragrance is heavenly. It's a really delightful scent. Frostweed. Now we're getting into flowers that bloom later in the season. Frostweed is one of those dependable fall bloomers for shade. So if you have a shady corner of your yard and you'd like to host native pollinators uh, who come to a nectar and gather pollen from this plant, um, then by all means, plant some frostweed. It's great. It's a perennial. It'll grow in the shade and uh, bloom in the fall. <clears throat> and then it has this cool parlor trick. When you get a deep freeze uh, that's rather sudden in the winter, the stems crack open, they leak out this uh, liquid sap, and that sap freezes in these long extruded curly cues like these. Uh, so this was taken on a cold winter morning, uh, the frost weed in my yard, and um, it's just doing this really interesting thing. You might look out if you have frost weed in your yard and think, who toilet papered my yard? And it's actually these white sheets of frost curly cues around the bases of the plants. Snail seed vine, um, it's not a flower per se that you might notice when it's flowering, but you will notice these red berries, especially in the fall and in the winter, once the uh, leaves have fallen, you'll still have these vines with these clusters of red berries. It's a really striking look with a black wrought iron fence. And uh, frequently you're gonna find that around antique cemeteries um, with those black iron fences and the red snail seed berries. Small palafox, palafoxia callosa. This one is the most amazing plant. It's so tidy and it's so delicate looking and yet it lives in the most harsh conditions imaginable. It's blooming now in July on a dry, chalky soils with exposed rock at the surface. And it'll keep blooming on into uh, the later months of the summer, possibly even into the fall if there's enough moisture. But you look at this little delicate thing and you think, how can that possibly get along in these really hard soils? It does. Somehow it does. And it loves it there. Another late summer plant is the gumweed. It's called gumweed because it's a little sticky and um, the leaves feel like post-it notes. If you feel those, it feels like it's going to stick to your finger, but then it peels right off. Once this flower um, has uh, opened, uh, well, actually, it's when the buds are opening before the center flowers are all the way formed. There's this kind of a white milky substance in there, too, that's also gummy. Uh, so gumweed, not a very appealing name, but it is a rather appealing blossom and great for the pollinators. Silverleaf nightshade. You can see that pale green silvery look on the petals. And that gives you a clue that this is a really drought tolerant plant. And sure enough, it will bloom in August in a place that gets no supplemental water at all. Um, it's perfectly happy doing that. Another tomato family relative. Late flowering bone set. 
It's right there in the name. It is a late flowering plant at the end of the season. It's green, green, green all summer, and then suddenly bursts out in these powder puffs of fragrant white blossoms. And usually they are just covered with butterflies. The butterflies really adore uh, this flower for fall. You can see a little bit of goldenrod in the background of this late flowering bone set. And here is another goldenrod. Um, I believe it's a different species. We have quite a few goldenrod species, but I wanted to make sure you got to see this because I need to tell you, goldenrod is not the plant that bothers your allergies in the fall. If you have fall hay fever, it's probably due to ragweed, which has tiny inconspicuous flowers and blooms at the same time. So while goldenrod is depending on pollinators like these to spread its pollen to another plant, ragweed is spewing out clouds of pollen into the air for you to breathe in. Um, and so don't blame the goldenrod, that's not the plant, but it is a great fall nectar and pollen source for our pollinators. American Beauty Berry, the flowers aren't so showy, but the berries sure are. I mean, you'll find this in the understory of our riparian woodlands or right at the edges of our woodlands. Most of our little orchids here in North Texas um, in the spiral orchid group are fall bloomers. So you may see these neat little spirals of white flowers coming up through the grasses. Occasionally, they might even show up in your lawn uninvited. Uh, these are the spiral orchids or the ladies' tresses orchids. Quite beautiful. And we actually have about six uh, species on subspecies here, including one that's a big teaser. It always looks like it's about to burst into bloom, but this is as good as it gets. Those flowers never actually open. Again, this is one of those plants with extra genes, and it simply clones seed for itself and never shows you the inside of those flowers. Maximilian sunflower, another dependable fall bloomer, um, where we have the monarch butterflies and the fall bumblebees that are just finishing up their seasonal life cycles depending on this plant for fall. It's a beautiful plant, a dependable bloomer, but it can be a bit of a bully in a home landscape. So it's great to see out on the prairie, uh, invited home with some caution. Eringo is another one of those very spiky plants that ranchers deliberately eradicated because it just didn't get along with their cows. Uh, nobody wants to risk their livestock being poked in the eye by one of these sharp tips on these uh, bracts. So they were pretty much eliminated from most areas. You can still find them in good prairie remnants and uh, little waste areas. They're so beautiful in terms of the architecture and the color on these plants. Quite exotic looking like little purple pineapples with blue anthers. Did you notice that um, stick insect down in the lower left? When I see these plants, they're almost always alive with insect life. Here's a honeybee coming in from the right, a carpenter bee in the middle, and guess who's there on the lower left? A praying mantis just waiting for the pollinators to come along because that praying mantis knows uh, this is the perfect place to wait for them. Another sure sign that it's fall is the blooming of snow on the prairie or possibly snow on the mountain in some sections of the Blackland Prairie. We have both. The, black, uh, the snow on the mountain has slightly wider leaves. A lot of the white that you see there actually is leaves, not flowers. Those flowers are the little things in the middle. Uh, but we see these showy bracts. We know it's blooming um, and it's definitely a sign of fall. Gay feather, our prairie gay feather in this area is Leatrice mucridata, and it does tend to bloom right when the monarchs come through at the end of the summer, early fall. Beautiful plant that serves our native bumblebees. It serves our monarchs. 
It serves all kinds of other great bumble, uh, butterflies, including this pipe vine swallowtail. Um, and it is one of our uh, sort of premier nectar plants uh, for fall creatures. So uh, it's great to include that. Perfect in a home landscape as well as out on the prairie. There's just nothing offensive about this plant. The leaves are like little bottle brushes and uh, they will stay green all summer until this pops up a bloom stalk in the fall. Here is a dense field of this at Oak Point Park in Play-Doh. This was once threatened by development. At this time, I believe it's safe from that threat. Uh, but if you want to continue to see any places where there are uh, little pieces of our native flora left, you really need to advocate with your local city and let them know that these are valuable. They're extremely rare with less than one tenth of 1% of our Blackland prairies left intact. And so if they have one of these in a local park, they need to be aware of its value, how very rare these are and how important they are to our local wildlife. Just a few more shots here, I'm wrapping up. Um, just wanted to give you some overviews of these lovely prairie spaces. And I hope that you will get outdoors and use the opportunity to go see some of our beautiful plants. Uh, best time for blooming is uh, probably April through May, but you will still see lots of lovely things in June and even on into July. All right, and I think that is all I had today, but I can uh, answer questions if, if that's okay. I'll be glad to take some questions. I see that there's something in the chat room. Would somebody like to read me any chat questions? Sure, Carol. Uh, so uh, we have a question from Camelia. How can we reach out to Carol with questions about native gardens? Is there, oh. Is there Yes, um, you can do that. Um, how about if I go ahead and let's see if I can open a chat room and I will put my email address in there. And you are welcome to do that. And I think I typed it right. So there it goes into the chat room for anybody that needs to see that. Okay. Hey. Thank you. Uh, then a question, uh, is there a way we can receive a list of these plants? Oh, uh, I had not made a list. Uh, actually I did, but I keep changing the show. So it would need to be updated. I could uh, go through and type one up and send it to Gregory if he has a way to post that for people. Do you have a way yeah. that we can do that? Okay. I can distribute it to people. Yes, and if you, if you, you know, I know it went really fast. I had to leave lots and lots of plants out because there are just so many uh, flowers of the Blackland Prairie. Uh, but if you would like to see this show again, it will be presented for the Master Naturalist State Meeting again in October. All right, another question from Dorothy. Uh, which of these would be your top five for the home landscape? Top five. Okay, that's a good question. Um, I really like the Leatrice that we saw uh, close to the end. Um, in my landscape, I like to include some goldenrod for the uh, late pollinators. Now, the goldenrod I have volunteered itself. So it's five to six feet tall and it's a little bit unruly. You want to check and choose one that's going to fit your landscape. I definitely would put in green milkweed for the pollinators. Um, uh, the, it's a great nectar source as well as a monarch host plant and it's easy to grow, a little bit more flexible on its uh, watering requirements. So let's see, that's three. Um, what else do I really love? I really love the standing wine cups. I think they're quite beautiful. Um, and uh, what can you, part of the problem is what can you get for a home landscape? I actually don't think I included Engelman's Daisy, either that or my slide skipped and I may have missed that one, but I would put in Engelman's Daisy or Cut Leaf Daisy for a home landscape too. I think that that might be my five. Okay. 
What about late fall blooming plants? Question from Connie. Yeah, so for the late fall blooming, um, that uh, tall fall bone set can be a handful. It does spread. And so for a home garden, you're going to want a way to contain that possibly with uh, some kind of borders or just be prepared to pull out the volunteers as it shows up uh, away from your original plant. Um, and uh, oh, let's see, again, most goldenrods bloom in the fall and a button bush can go on and on if it, if it gets sufficient water. So, um, or it will bloom again with a second round sometimes. Um, what else did we have for fall? Perhaps if I go back and uh, check my, uh, yeah, let's see if I can do that. If I can check my slide sorter. No, that's not worth doing. Um, but, you know, walk in your local landscapes where there are native plants and see what's happening out there um, and get a feel for what those plants do. And then you'll know which ones you want to invite home. Maximilian sunflower is also really great for fall, uh, but it tends to get really rambunctious in a home garden. All right. Uh, if visitors want to see prairie wildflowers, what is the best time to have them visit? I would say any time from April uh, through the first half of June. And uh, it depends a lot on the season. This year, our native wildflowers were about a month behind in many cases. Things that came up from deep underground from bulbs, they were right on time. Uh, but things that um, have uh, their growing crowns just under the soil surface or at the soil surface, they suffered from that freeze. And then they had to recover from the roots and start all over again. So uh, some of our plants were right on time, some were a month late. And every year you will see different combinations of flowers blooming together uh, because of the weather they've had over the last uh, couple of years. Okay, and I actually I might piggyback off that a little bit. Uh, I live in Southern Dallas County. Mm -hmm. And um, can you recommend some places to see uh, uh, native prairie parcels, or I think Kachina Prairie, uh, that's in Ellis County. Is that considered Blackland Prairie? I, I believe it still is. Um, and uh, so I think there's some uh, websites online where you can check, but it has quite a few of the same flowers, even if it uh, crosses over into the post oak um, uh, type soils. So um, that's a good question. Um, I haven't been to the Kachina myself, but I know quite a few people who work on it as volunteers, and uh, I've seen some lovely things uh, in photos from there. Um, okay, southern uh, prairie spots you could recommend, or uh, southern? Well, there's um, uh, Cedar Hill State Park, Cedar Ridge Preserve, um, down there in southern uh, southwestern Dallas County, I think. Uh, I believe that's still Dallas County. Um, uh, Kachina Prairie is a good one, and um, that's in Ellis County. Um, there are, wow, I don't get south too much. To tell you the truth, I usually range north towards the Hagerman um, and up that way. Uh, so my home county is Collin County, and I tend to see the things up in Anna and Farmersville and Hunt County and Fannin County. Uh, one place to check that's overlooked is an old cemetery uh, because you know they've been inadvertently protected from development a lot of times so if you can find a cemetery that was founded in the 1850 somethings that's a great place to go look for native wildflowers okay uh, thank, thank you carol uh, you're welcome and, uh, i don't see any other questions in the chat and i see we're a few minutes past our in the yeah. time so i just want to thank you so much for joining us just uh, been a, um, a beautiful tour uh, of the, the prairies. Uh, I'm just overwhelmed with the amount of diversity. And, you know, and I know you still had to make choices about what you included. This uh, is just a small assortment. Yeah. Yeah. And we want to thank everybody who tuned in today, whether you were just here for Carol's presentation or if you were here for other natural expo events that went on this morning. Uh, also in association with the Nature Expo. Uh, don't forget to check out the short nature videos on the Pond website. Um, and I'm just gonna post these here in the chat. Uh, 
Many of our partners like uh, the Master Naturalist contributed short nature videos and we have those for your enjoyment. Um, and we, we've got thank yous uh, coming in for Carol. So um, uh, thank you again and uh, thank you everybody attended and uh, hope everybody has enjoys the rest of your day and your weekend. Well, thank you all for coming and you can check out my blog at carolsworld.net where there's lots of plant content.